All right. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. Okay. Um, so we basically have um, just a few things that I want to do today. Um, the big thing is, is that um, I want to, I want to go through kind of how to work up the observations that you have and make a couple of important points um, ab about the data, right, that might explain sort of why we were collecting some of the measurements we were collecting um, on, uh, on Tuesday, right? And so I'm actually going to go through um, one of the group's data um, that that you all shared with me and sort of work that up into um, a discharge measurement and also um, create a couple of the plots that um, show you how to create some of the plots that uh, are requested in the actual lab write up. Um, then um, if there's time after that, um, I want to go through the where to find uh, flow data on the USGS website. Um, uh, the, their interface has, has changed quite a bit. Um, so it's a little bit new to me. Um, but, uh, it's probably a good exercise to sort of show you where you would find flow data. Um, in this case, we'll look for data from the Boise river. Uh, the closest, the closest gauging station to where we were at is actually downstream at, um, Glenwood, um, just right there in garden city. Um, and we'll kind of look at, look for the data that we, um, look for the, for flow data, um, ab about when we were sort of out there on Tuesday. Now, bear in mind as well, we, we were just gauging, um, you know, one, uh, one side channel of the stream. And so, um, but it'll be interesting to sort of see like what fraction of the, the river flow is actually maybe going through that side channel. So, okay. Any questions before I get started? No? Okay. All right. So I'm going to share my screen here. This is an Excel workbook that I created um, for, of, of one of the data sets that, um, uh, one of the data sets that folks, um, uh, gave me, um, a, a picture of, um, so this was, this is actual data from Tuesday, you know, so it may, you know, it should be pretty close, hopefully to the data that other folks got, um, when they cycled through the folks that were not in this group, you may have different numbers of measurements that you have taken. Uh, you may have taken measurements at different locations. Um, and your velocities obviously will sort of vary slightly um, and you know the the depths as well but um again you know one of the things i underscored to everybody in the field on tuesday was that um you know we don't want to do math you know, don't do math in the field to the extent that you don't have to right um doing doing the math is for kind of rainy days in the office and not for sunny days in the field so all this is is kind of a one to one transcription pretty much of the data that I got from this group. Um, the data that I got as well didn't have the labels I've I went ahead and put labels in here. Um, you know, and so this is this is actually sort of the way that uh, I would have transcribed, you know, this data from a field book if this was data, for instance, for my thesis or for a project. Um, this is the very first thing that I would have done um, after getting back from the field. Okay, and I would I would still keep the field book, or at a minimum, you know, keep scans of the field book and sort of stash that away some places as legacy data, right? But um, this would become kind of the the spreadsheet in which I started to actually work from. Um, there are some things that, however, um, that are maybe missing from this spreadsheet that I might want to capture, um, we would in in the field of in sort of data management terms, we would often refer to this as the so called metadata. Um, but so what are some of the things that in addition to just the raw data that um, I might have 
I might want to actually capture in this spreadsheet that maybe you actually captured in your field notebook. A picture? Yeah, so a picture certainly like, right, we would have had maybe like a couple of photographs taken that go in, for instance, the same folder, right, of, um, you know, that this spreadsheet goes in. Um, so pictures, can anyone else, anything that I should record in the spreadsheet itself that you can think of? Date, date and time. Yeah, date and time. Yep. So exactly. So, um, and I'm going to record that here. This, so it was what? It was uh, 2021, 03, uh, what was it? 23. Okay. Um, and then the, the time, what was the approximate time this was taken? Maybe somewhere around like, you know, 1130 a.m. Mountain Standard Time, right? Something like that. Okay. Anything else? Other thoughts you, you guys have? The weather? Yep, so weather would be good, right? Some Just some general comments here, right? So, um, right, just some comments like that. Okay, there's a couple more that might be useful. Um, one might be who is actually running the observations, right? Um, so you might say something like who is on the rod, right? So this is the person that was actually like doing the recordings. I don't know who this was, um, name, right? And then, you know, somebody else that is, you know, you might want to describe the roles of the other people that are there, right? Um, now, why might that be important to record the names? So if someone sees the data, they can refer to that person or like if you use the data, you can give credit to them. Yeah, so certainly like making sure that people are given acknowledgement, right, for collecting the data, right, whether that's in reports or that's in publications or presentations. Um, but the other one, too, is is just that, you know, if I start looking at this data and I see something funny, right, um, you know, one thing that I noticed in this data Right. Uh, there was a couple of things, um, you know, they're subtle, but when you do this a while, you start to notice subtle things. Right. We look for sort of general trends. One here is that, you know, uh, there's this kind of pretty big dip in velocity right at this location here. Right. Where the depth doesn't change all that much, but the velocity kind of decreases by almost a foot per second. There's something similar that happens you know, right about here, right? Although it's it's decreasing. Um, so things like that, it's, it's helpful to sort of know who is collecting the observations because either they might have recollections of that or they may actually have in their, their own field notes, like, oh yeah, there, you know, there was actually like this big, you know, this was right next to a big like boulder that was in the middle of the channel. Um, and it was kind of creating this kind of local eddy or whatever, right? So, um, so it's good to have the names on here, certainly to give credit, but also to, um, you know, to have to be able to go back to that person and sort of verify or ask questions of like, okay, I'm seeing something a little funny in the data, like, is that correct? Or, you know, was something, did I transcribe something incorrectly, right? Um, in the field notebooks, this is what, you know, was it, a, 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 was it actually a seven when I thought it was a one, right? Um, so those are the kinds of things that are um, that are helpful to sort of denote um, in your in your spreadsheet, right? Uh, okay. Okay. So um, the broader sort of story there, though, right, is that it's really important to kind of keep metadata like that because you know the further and further you get away from this, and especially if you're in a situation where you're doing, you know. If you're in, if you're a hydro tech and there's, you know, you're in the middle of field season and you're seeing 
dozens of, of cross sections a week, right? Um, it's really important to sort of capture these notes. And, you know, organizations like the USGS have kind of automated software for doing this, but um, it is really important to sort of capture these details because they provide ways to sort of make sure you understand what the data is and not just kind of, you know, report the numbers blindly without sort of any context or thought about um, the conditions that underlie them. So, um, so I'm actually going to sort of proceed with starting to do some of the calculations that will get us towards our discharge measurement. Okay. And um, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to um, make sure that we're all in consistent units here. Right. Um, and so there's different ways of, of doing this, but one thing that you might want to do, for instance, is I might um, I might just go ahead and format these cells here and color them something like, you know, a, a light orange, let's say, right? And um, if you look here, right, I have my column headings. This is the label, right? So what what this point is, I'll blow this up a little bit so that you can all see it. Um, Here's the label of what what each of these points was um, the station that's the location along the tape. The depth at that particular location and then the velocity from the marsh McBurney. Um, now we are all in sort of different units here right, so the station data is in in units of meters. Uh, the depth measurements recorded here, at least we're in units of tens of feet. The velocity measurements uh, are in units of feet per second. So I'm going to convert all of this into um, I'm going to convert all of this into imperial units, right? To to get an ultimate discharge measurement in units of cubic feet per second. But what I'm doing first here is I'm I'm just going to color code these cells, and this is my raw data. I'm not going to change. I'm not going to change any of the data in here. I'm not going to insert any columns. Any columns I insert will be to the right. Um, and I'm just going to leave my raw data basically as it as it would have been sort of in the field notebook, right? Um, so this does a couple of things. One, it signals to the user like, hey, this was actually the data that was correct, that was collected, right? There were no sort of, there's no um, corrections or modifications to the data as recorded. Um, and then B, this kind of serves as a double check, right? This was what, if I, if I was able to go back into that field notebook and open it to that page, right? And, and that's maybe some of that met, metadata that you want to collect, right? Like which, um, field notebook number and page number, right? Um, so if I, let me insert another row there. If I need to go back, I can go to whatever field notebook this is and whatever page. And if I open it up, I should see this, right? And so if I need to quickly double check my observations, I can sort of always uh, check them against what is in that, that field notebook, okay? All right, so I'm going to, uh, just because I like consistency in my spreadsheets, it's the engineer in me, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna make the width of a whole bunch of these. I don't know how, we won't need all of these, but I'm going to make all of these similarly wide. Um, I'm going to, okay. Uh, bold those, bold my headings. Okay, so um, the first thing, there's a couple things that I need to convert. Um, the first one is that I need to convert the station data to um, to units of feet. Right, so this is still going to be station. That's my my label, but now this is going to be in feet. Um, and you know there there are already um, there are conversions in Excel to do this. Um, I don't use them. I you know I I I prefer to use the formulas in the spreadsheet rather than kind of um, use the conversions. The conversions are fine. Um, the conversion between meters and feet, and again, I told one group this on Tuesday, I don't expect you to remember this. I remember this because, again, I'm an engineer and it was sort of like hammered into my brain, so I'll never forget it. Um, 
uh, but there are 3.2808 feet per meter, right? So if I want to get station in feet, I'm going to multiply my station in meters times 3.2808, okay? And then I'm not gonna keep that much precision. I will maybe keep, um, two decimal places, uh, and even that I could, you know, I'm not going to argue about sig figs right now. That's, you know, this is not that class. Um, but, you know, that's going to be good enough for what I, what I need. Okay. So now if I just copy and paste this, um, into the cells below, I should get, um, the width or the station, the location in my, um, uh, the location of each of these stations and units of feet. Okay. All right. So the next thing I need to do is convert my depth observations from units of tenths of feet to units of feet. Right. And that one's quite a bit easier. Um, this is just my depth in tens of feet divided by 10, right? And if I copy that, okay. All right. Um, and my velocity should be fine. Okay. Um, what's, what's the equation for depth again? It's just, it's just the, um, it's just the depth in tenths of feet, right? So the this group just recorded the number of uh, uh, of those um, oh, notches in the depth rod, and those are in units of tenths of feet. So this is in units of tenths of feet. So if you divide by 10, you get uh, the feet in, in decimals. So this would be three quarters of a foot, 0.75 feet, right? So that's nine inches. Um, so it's in, in decimal, right? So they recorded a 7.5 tenths of a foot, which is 0.75 feet, okay? All right, so, okay. Now this is the part where um, we need to start being a little bit careful, right? Because as I mentioned, um, what we did is I told you, I was very sort of clear with folks, like measure what is on the tape. Don't worry about trying to get kind of where you're at in the channel. So the tape started at the water's edge at about 0.35 feet. And this group actually didn't record it, but I think, was it nine or does somebody else have a different? What was the location of the water edge? This was Carrie's group, so. It I mean, was, um, it was at nine. nine and then... Okay. Okay. All right, so the water's edge, water's edge, what's important about that, right, is that um, we have the station location, but this is a location where the velocity and the depth is zero, kind of by definition, right, because it's right at the water's edge. It's right at the start of the channel. So um, this actual station location is not the distance along, the distance within the cross section. And I'm going to draw a figure of what I mean by that. Um, so what we need to do, let me turn my tablet on. Okay, so let's see. All right, uh, that should be good. Okay, so let's say here's our, here's our cross section, right? Okay. And on top of that, I'm going to add the, the water surface elevation. Let's say. No, nope. stop. Don't do that. Okay. 
So here's here's my water surface, right? Okay. Um, and then we have, we'll say in yellow, right? The, the tape, the tape was like right here, right? So this is our measurement tape. Okay. And, um, this location here, so the start, the water's edge, right? The, the coordinate here is X equals 0 0.35 meters or whatever it was in in feet 1.29 i think right um let me just see was that right 1.15 feet okay 1.15 feet okay so when we took measurements right um what you did is you know you you dropped the rod down here here's your velocity probe at you know, 0.4 times the depth off the bottom. Okay. And you noted this location as the station. You noted the depth here, right? So we'll call this the depth H. Okay. And we noted the velocity here. I'll call this U. Okay. Um, and this station location, right, um, what what we're actually interested in is not really even the station location. What we need here is the width of the kind of little rectangular flow cell through which we're going to compute the kind of discharge increment through this rectangle. Right. So is this just cross section area like math? This is just pretty much cross-section area math. Yeah. Okay. So, but um, I want to be careful here because uh, the this particular group took kind of nice, uh, clean half meter increments. Um, you didn't necessarily have to do that, right? And sometimes there's important reasons not to do that. Okay. So, but what we care about actually is is where the other observation was taken. Right, so our, our previous observation and our subsequent observation were taken at some other location here, right? So this station here and this station here, right? So if this is, I'm gonna call this uh, X, I'm gonna use a subscript here. I'm gonna say this is X sub, um, I'll say x sub seven. I don't know how many this is, right? This is x sub eight. This is x sub nine, right? And these numbers here are just an address, right? Like, so this is I'm what I'm saying, which I don't know to be true, right? But just for the purposes of um, diagramming this out, this location is the seventh place where we took a, a velocity observation. Okay, so if we want the width, right, of this flow cell, we have the depth, we took the depth with the rod, we have the velocity. If we want the width, the delta x here, what is that? How do we get that? Can somebody tell me what that is in words? How would you describe to me without equations or in words where the ends of this rectangular cell are? Thoughts? Just be the width between like x sub seven and x sub eight, and then you just take like what right minus left or something like that and find the width. Yeah. So the the distance between these right between my measurements is just x seven x eight minus x seven, right? That's the distance between the 
between here and then this distance is just right the next distance here i'll write this here x that's just x9 minus x8 this is x8 minus x7 and then our right these cells don't actually exist right this is just a kind of conceptual rectangle out in the middle of our cross section okay the boundary of that is just halfway in between those observations okay so our width is just so this delta x our width is just x sub 8 minus x sub 7 over 2 plus right that's half the distance here plus x sub 9 minus x sub 8 over 2 right folks see that so it's it's half the distance between our observations between our previous and our subsequent observation right if we take half of those distances and add them up we get the width of this rectangle here okay okay all right so i'm going to save that just in case anybody needs it and then i'm going to switch back to the spreadsheet and we're going to go through and do that calculation and sorry i just noticed there was maybe a chat okay yeah okay great okay so um yeah so dallin asks uh the if the distances between x sub 7 to x sub 8 is the same as x8 to x9 then wouldn't the width be uniform so the answer is yes right so in the vast majority of these cases you know we're dealing with a width that is um almost exactly a meter right but again um i I would encourage you to use the more general solution just because, um, well, one location where it is not the same, right, is this location right here at the at the edge of the channel, right? Because we did an observation at one meter and, uh, right, so th this, the, the width here, um, well, and actually the, the other thing here is the boundaries, you always have to be really careful on the boundaries because here, there's actually not an observation between, um, there's not an observation here, right? This is just zero. So the, the width of the rectangle here is this entire distance from the water's edge to my first observation, right? And then plus half of the distance from um, this first observation here to my next observation, okay? so. Uh, that's a good point. We always have to be really careful with the boundaries. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to call this flow cell width. And it's going to be in units of feet. Okay. And um, my flow cells are only going to be at those locations where i have um where i have a discharge observation right so i'm not going to have a flow cell width at my water's edge right these water edges are sort of like special special cases okay all right so the flow cell width of this first cell is just going to be equal to the station location here I'm going to I'm going to have to use parentheses here the station location um, where I took my my velocity measurement minus the, the location at the water's edge and that's again not divided by two because it's the full window but then I'm going to add the location, the X location at my next observation 
minus the observa the x location where I took my observation. And that width will be divided by two. Okay. All right, so the width here uh, is 2.95 feet basically, right? And I can always um, kind of double check that, right? So this should be about, oh, um, what is that? One foot, um, almost two feet. So like 0. 0.9 plus um, another almost like two feet. Right, or actually this is like 1.2 plus 0.9 divided by two. I get that right. So this is like a foot and a half. So this is, yeah, this is like two feet, almost 1.9 feet. Plus like another, this is about two feet or a foot 0.7 divided by two. It's like 0.8 so yeah okay so this works out this works out about right well this is the exact number the math in my head works out about right okay okay now um for all of the other flow cells the last one i have to be careful about right so for the flow cells between um from right here right my second observation to my next to last observation um, this equation, the equation that we did on the whiteboard is effectively the same, right? So my flow cell width here is going to be the location at my measurement minus the location at my previous measurement and half of that distance plus the location at my next measurement minus the location at my current measurement and half that distance. Right. And these should come out because these are nice, right? Like, uh, you know, half meter widths between these, this should come out to about half a meter. Right. And again, 3.2808, uh, feet per meter, right? Half of that is about 1.6. Okay. So when I copy this as well, this should, that should be, so these are in fact uniform. Okay. Okay. But again, I would not assume that these are uniform, right? Um, okay. So the last one, again, I have to be careful. And so I have the half window. So this is going to be the location of my current measurement minus my previous measurement. And that is divided by two plus the whole distance from my, the water's edge minus the location of my current measurement. So now I have a width of all of those individual flow cells um, where I have observations of, of uh, velocity, okay? Okay. So now what I wanna determine is actually, and this, this is going to get us to the actual computing the cross-sectional area. So now what I wanna compute is the flow cell area and this will be in units of feet squared okay okay so here um, on these edges again um, I'm not going to have I'll actually gray these out just to remind myself that I I shouldn't expect any data in these cells right? Because these are the water's edge cells. Okay. Okay. So now how do I get the area of each of these flow cells? Multiply it by the depth. Yep. So the width 
that we just computed times the depth. Okay. So that's the flow area in units of feet squared. Okay. And now I can just copy this. And the cross-sectional area then is just the sum of that, right? So if, if I do the sum of this, this is just my cross-sectional area. So about 22.8 square feet, okay? Uh, now, I'm gonna get the flow cell discharge. This will be in units of, of cubic feet per second, okay? Um, and, how do I get this now? Again, I'm not gonna have observations on the edges. What is this? Wouldn't it be, be area times velocity? No. Do the units of that work out? Feet squared times feet per second? No. Are you sure? Well, that'd just be feet. A cube, cubic feet per second. Cubic feet. Yeah. yeah, so that's right. No, you your instinct is correct. <laughs> I, I just think, didn't think the units were gonna work out. The units work out, right? So and this is you know, this is maybe a little bit confusing because we're getting a discharge, but what does this discharge here represent? Is this the discharge for the whole cross section? No, it's just that one cross. -section. It's just that little rectangle, right? So these are all a bunch of little rectangles with their own velocities, right? You can think of this as like Bob Ross's trees in the forest, right? Like each one of these is a happy little flow cell and together they make uh, a happy little side channel. Okay. Right. Um, okay. So, Yes, it's just the it's just the flow cell area times the velocity at that location. Okay, and we could just copy and paste that formula, and that's going to give us the um, uh, that's going to give us the the incremental flow in each one of those flow cells. Okay, and if we look at this, right, um, the the interesting thing here, right, is that if you look at this, um, this sort of should comport with our expectations, right? The places where we have the largest stream flow through our individual cells here are even, um, are even, uh, uh, I'll, that's a really good question, Dallin. I'm, I'm getting distracted by it. I'll come back to that in just a second. Um, so the, the cells through which, you know, if we just look at this, right. And we look at, okay, which one of my cells is transporting the most water, right. Or which ones have the highest sort of flow rate. We have one here. That's like one and a half. Right. Um, and we have, uh, let's see. Um, another one that's 1.06, and then we have some in the 0.9 area, right? And so what's interesting here is that, um, the flow, the, the cell area, right? Or the discharge, um, it's not necessarily one or the other that contributes to the flow, but it's the product of the two. Right, so you can have higher discharge either because you have a higher velocity through that flow cell or just the flow cell is deeper, right? And if you think about that, that should make sense. Like, uh, you know, the Mississippi River is not particularly fast down around New Orleans, but it's really, really big, right? So the discharge should be really high, okay? Similarly, you know, the, the flow in a small mountain creek, the velocity might be really high, 
but its cross-sectional area is low, and so it's not a lot of flow, okay? All right, so now how do we get our whole cross-sectional discharge? What do we compute to get that? Don't you want to find the mean? Is it the... Is it the mean, like add every every number up and divide it by how many numbers there are? So if we did that, that would give us the average flow in each one of the cells, right? So to get the total, would you just add them up? Yeah, so it's literally just the sum of all of these incremental discharges, okay? And again, th this is actually nothing more than an integral, right? So the total discharge I'm getting here is, you know, about 11.8 cubic feet per second CFS. Okay. Um, so th that's it. We got, we got our discharge. Now um, we had to do a number of things there and we had to make a number of sort of assumptions, right? Um, we had to sort of assume that our cross section could be approximated by a number of different, um, you know, rectangular boxes in the channel. And Dolan asks in the chat, to be more accurate, wouldn't we um, find the area of the trapezoid that each one cell makes? Um, and then Ian said, well, I think that that might actually be less accurate because we can't account for the missing corners. So um, the, the answer to that general question, right, is that, okay, so we made some assumptions about the geometry. Let me draw a picture real quick of sort of what this looks like. I'll draw um, a slightly different picture of, of what um, Dalen is uh, proposing because um, it's a, it's an important point and it actually gets into some of our, um, it gets into some of the um, numerical, numerical calculus basically. Um, and so again, uh, let's, uh, let's, uh, I'm waiting for my tablet to turn back on. Okay. So let's draw another cross section here, right? Let's have it be a little more variable. Uh, let's draw our water surface, right? Um, and effectively what, what we said is that um, we, we went and calculated basically um, the flow through a bunch of rectangles that essentially looked like this, right? If this is our, our, our depth measurement was like right here, right? So some parts that's a problem because, you know, we have a little bit of an overshoot here, right? Other parts, we have a little bit of an undershoot. Okay. So this this particular kind of flow cell here our depth you know it's getting deeper and so we're underestimating part of our the depth and part of our flow cell and we're maybe overestimating it in other parts um in this one the sort of opposite is true right we're overestimating the depth in our flow cell so the question is is well you know why why wouldn't we perhaps just um another way of doing this would be okay well i have you know, I have this data here, I can just take this, this is actually a triangle. Um, or, you know, I could take the average of these two depths, right, the average might be here. Um, and maybe this is the trapezoid. Um, and again, I, I average these two, uh, these two depths, right. And so maybe I get a trapezoid that looks, you know, something like uh, this. Right. Um, and so why wouldn't I just use the trapezoid? Um, you could. And in fact, for those of you that get, you know, to calc, maybe two, maybe do this in calc two, certainly in calc three, um, this is what's called a numerical integral, right? And there's many, many different ways of doing this. What we did is what's called the rectangular method. Okay. Uh, what, um, what Dalen just proposed is is literally just called the trapezoid method or the trapezoid rule. Okay, so also perfectly legitimate, right? Um, a little bit more complicated. The geometry in our spreadsheet would be a little bit, you know, more. You know, the area of a trapezoid is like you know one half times the two. You know, these two times the height. I don't remember what it is. Right, I'd have to look it up. Um, 
but it's another way of sort of doing the integral and we would get a slightly different answer um is it more is it more accurate uh perhaps um it, the the numerical integral is certainly more precise when we do it that way um and so if you had those measurements yeah it might make sense to use the the trapezoidal rule instead of the the rectangular um rule now that's that's the case for a um for a uh a channel that looks like this right that has this kind of like nice what we call a catenary look to it um if we looked instead at a, a channel cross section this is actually a little bit more like the cross section we had right that um kind of just did this you know maybe it got a little bit deeper there right um you know this this cross section in particular um maybe rectangles aren't so bad yeah on the on the corners here a rectangle is not so great because my rectangle sort of comes right here but here you know my rectangles are actually pretty pretty good okay so if we go back and look at our spreadsheet right if we look at our depth measurements um you know they they span anywhere from like half a foot to a little bit more than a foot but it's not changing too rapidly right it's changing by maybe a tenth of a foot um between one one measurement to the next um you know, maybe a rectangular method isn't going to give us um, that imprecise of a result or that inaccurate of a result, right? So, um, but that's a great question because uh, the um, you will get a you will get a different um, a different answer by using a slightly different numerical method. Okay. All right. Hey, so, Leo, question again, real quick. Yep. Um, so I was just kind of plugging my numbers in and stuff while you were talking about the flow rate um, for each cell. To find the flow rate of each cell, do we average the left and right points? Uh, of velocity? Yeah, for the velocity of each cell. I did not. I just took the actual velocity of that cell um, and then multiplied it by the area. Okay, so you yeah. did the... Okay, I see. Yeah. And so, yeah. And th there's, again, um, there are many different numerical ways to do this calculation. Oh right? yeah. You did the, you kind of did like the midpoint. Yep. Okay. When I did, I did the, uh, left end points. And so I would probably have to average the. Yep. Yeah, ex exactly. Yeah. There's, um, you know, how you compute this flow cell area and flow cell discharge right um with both the flow cell and the velocity measurements all of those different kind of numerical again numerical integration schemes um work slightly differently um yeah. the, the answers shouldn't be too far off from you know any one way to the other um mm -hmm. you know but it it will be different right and so i guess a, a lot of that just sort of underscores that um that uh there is a true discharge out there, right? Like there is actually a true, there is a true amount of water that is moving through that side channel. Um, but any of our efforts to measure it are going to be imperfect, right? So this is still at the end of the day, an estimate that has some amount of uncertainty that has to do with how precise I am at my depth measurements, where I took those depth measurements, how precise my um, my Marsh McBurney is, whether it's well calibrated or not, which we didn't sort of talk about is instrumentation calibrated, instrumentation calibration, and also like the actual numerical techniques that I'm using, right? So that's a really good, and you know, all of this is a really great conversation because it underscores that all of these observations that we get have some amount of uncertainty in them, right? And so, uh, we need to be careful about sort of over interpreting right now that you've seen sort of how the sausage is made over interpreting um, kind of the precision or the accuracy of of these of these measurements right and so anytime you see observations like this you know presented 
one thing that you always kind of want to do or ask is, okay, what's, what are the uncertainty bounds on here, right? Like, okay, your estimate is 11.8 feet, um, cubic feet per second, but what's the plus or minus on that, right? Is it one CFS? Is it two CFS? Is it 0.1 CFS, right? Those are always things kind of scientifically to be kind of, you know, drilling down on anytime somebody sort of presents you with um, some information like this. Okay. Was your data used from the upstream measurement or the downstream one? I don't know. Uh, Carrie? Quite a bit different numbers. Okay. Sorry, I couldn't unmute myself. It's the upstream one. Okay, that makes that makes more sense because I'm getting an area of like 0.3 feet squared. And we did take a point, there was one point that um, it had a rock in front of it. And so it was slower than it should have been. Okay. So if I was gonna take like one away, I would have taken that one away. And then why would it be better to take less measurements? Less measurements? Yeah, you uh, said that we took it every 0.5 and that's not always the way to go. So oh, I, um, I don't necessarily, uh, I wouldn't generally conclude that less is better. I'm, I guess what I was saying is you might be able to get away with fewer, right? Like if you have a very, very uniform and rectangular channel, right, where things aren't changing that much from one site to the next, then you probably could get away with bigger increments, right? And you might do that if, for instance, like, hey, um, I expect you to be uh, doing eight cross sections a day, right? Like sometimes you just, it's not really cutting corners. You just have to be efficient with where you're taking measurements. Um, but sometimes you can get away with fewer, fewer measurements, but generally more is better, right? But more requires more time and effort. Okay. Okay. Any other questions about this? Okay. The other thing that I, um, that I, one of the things that is on the lab write up that's asking you to do is um, is uh, plot up the actual cross section. Um, and if it's not immediately clear, right, one of the things is, is that we didn't have a survey rod out there, right? Like we didn't have a total station. Um, so we don't know what the I know what the depth is, but I I don't know what my right. I don't know what my actual ele elevation is of that site. Okay, um, that's okay. We can actually still get a plot of our cross section. Um, what we would do in that case is just um, assume what's called a, a datum, right? So we would assume a datum height, right? And it would, you know, it would represent. Um, either you know some location and we would reference all of our depth observations rel re relative to that datum location so what i'm actually going to do is for my stations i'm going to um, assume a datum of the water's edge so i'm going to assume the water's edge elevation and, and this is actually you know an an easy way to do it if we had a total station we could just measure the height of the water's edge in absolute terms, and then we'd actually have absolute heights for our cross section. But um, what I'm going to do is just assume that our water surface um, is at a fixed elevation and and I'm going to assign an arbitrary elevation. Um, and then I'm going to calculate the elevation of all of my cross sectional points relative to that assumed elevation. Okay, so I'm going to create another field here called elevation. It's going to be in units of feet. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay. So um, again, my station ele my the elevation of my water's edge is the thing that I'm going to assume, and it has zero depth, right? So I'm just going to assume a number um, of a hundred feet, right? And this is just an arbitrary, okay, my water surface elevation is 100 feet. If I really needed to know what it was, maybe I would go back and resurvey it and get it in absolute terms. 
But for the purposes of plotting this cross section, I'm going to use relative a, a relative datum and create sort of um, you know create elevations that are relative to this artificial datum. The the only thing that I need to be absolutely clear though is that when I communicate this to anybody else, right? I need to define what that datum is. Okay, I need to tell them that like, hey. My datum is assuming water surface elevation of my cross section is 100 feet. That's not correct, but it helps me show the actual elevation of my cross section. Okay. Okay. So now, um, how do I get the uh, actual, the, the artificial elevation of each one of these measurement sites? So at my next site, which is just you know, uh, 2.95 um, feet over, right? Um, I have a depth of 0.6 feet. So what will my elevation at that site be? Or how will I compute the elevation? Would we be point? subtracting that? Subtracting what from what? Uh, 0.6 from 100. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I'm going to say, okay, well, the elevation here is just a hundred because a hundred, right? The depth here is just relative to the water surface. So this is 0.6 down, right? So it's just 100 minus the depth. Um, Leo, quick question. So when I did this, cause I made a graph of my data, I just made zero my elevation. So I just had to make every other one negative. So yep. I just divided it all by negative one. So it just kind of gave me it on a zero would be the water surface water yeah surface. that's totally fine too right um as long as you're just communicating what your what your arbitrary datum is right yeah. as long as as you make sure you define that and in this case um right i could just as easily you know now that i have this in formula form um if somebody said oh no actually the water you know we did take an observation of the water surface elevation um and actually it is uh you know 20 five hundred sixty seven point five feet right um it's going to update that right so if i have that absolute information i can always go back and compute um i can compute the the actual absolute observation so the point is just that you know just make sure you're communicating what your datum is okay that makes sense um and then now i can just copy this and if i've done this correctly Um, I will also get um, 100 at my um, at my other water's edge, right? Um, and if you look here, well, all I did is I, I used, uh, if, if you didn't know this already, um, you can use dollar signs around the column and the row to indicate that I want to fix the, the cell from which I'm doing my differencing, right? So my fixed datum location is always going to be this water's edge cell here. And I wanna subtract the depth from that datum, right? And so I just used my dollar signs here to denote that I wanna fix that cell as J10, okay? Okay. Um, so now all I need to do is just plot that up Right, so I think what I will do is we will plot this. Um, I will use this scatter chart here, right? And of course, you know, this there is a um, there's a distortion here. This is not to scale, okay? Um, and I want to change. Uh, select data and my X values here are going to be my station location in feet. Okay, so it looks largely the same. Okay, I could go back and change this. Um, let's move this chart to its own sheet. Here we go. Okay, so 
I can change this to being 30. Okay, so there's my cross section, right? Um, and my water surface elevation would actually just be right here, right? And this this looks about like, you know, where, um, right, we had our kind of thaw wig over here on the right, you know, towards the right bank, we kind of had that deeper part of the channel, right? But this is largely our our cross section right here, right? This looks approximately, I think, what like what we, um, what we, what we observed when we were out there, okay? All right. Uh, the other thing that we would want to do, right, is, and this is um, just to kind of illustrate our velocity distribution. Um, the next thing that we might want to do is plot the velocity um, as, a, as a function of our um, location. So I'll create another chart with that. Um, Velocity is one where you can get a little bit more creative. I'm going to plot this as a bar chart, maybe. Um, not that kind. I don't want that either. These are histograms. I don't think that's what I want. I don't want a waterfall. Can I just do a simple bar chart? Oh, here we go. All right. Clustered column. Okay. All right. So... Um, well, this is, no, I'm not going to do this kind because I'm going to get wrapped around the axle with, um, with my X location. So I'll just use again, um, a line chart. Um, and Again, I'll select the data here, um, horizontal axes are my station location, and I will put this in its own chart as well. Okay. Um, and so maybe um, one thing that's a little bit interesting maybe is that, um, you know, if we look at this cross-sectional, this cross-sectional profile here, so here's our cross-section. If we toggle back and forth with our velocity profile, what's a couple things that you kind of notice here, right? That maybe don't, are not necessarily what we would have expected. You'd expect this spike in velocity to match up with the deepest point in the river, probably. Yeah, it's a little bit surprising, right? That um, that our 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 highest velocity is not um, is uh, is not here in sort of the deepest part of our our channel. Okay, and if you pair that with you know, what Carrie just reported a couple minutes ago of like, hey, you know, we there was one place where there was sort of like a boulder right upstream of our observations where we get a, you know, where we got a lower velocity than expected. Um, where's a good hypothesis for where that boulder actually was? It's at that low point where it falls unexpectedly at 11. This point. one, yeah, right yep. there. And so the other thing that's interesting too is that your highest velocity is actually immediately, right? Like in in the next, you know, the the next observation over, and then the one kind of further towards the right bank from there is also kind of one of the higher velocity values, right? Um, and so what's happening in this vicinity? What's that boulder doing? Maybe it's blocking the flow. So then. It was showing that it was a lower, or it's pushing the water around it. Yeah, exactly. So we have, it looks like like a local acceleration here, right? So there's a boulder, you know, upstream of this location here. The velocity is slower immediately downstream, but the presence of that boulder kind of causes acceleration around the side of that boulder, meaning that we have higher velocities on the on either side of it, okay? So, 
So just some simple observations that we can sort of start to make, right? So these are some kind of cool interpretations based on the data that we collected. Okay, so that is, um, I think that that's pretty much all other than some reflection sort of exercises you have to do. Um, that's all that all the sort of workup that you would need to do to kind of complete the exercises for this week's lab. Um, do you folks have any questions? In my notes, I wrote cubic feet per second, and it's not it's feet per second for velocity, huh? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, your velocities are all in feet per second. Because cubic feet per second would be like an area, and we didn't have like an area, it was just going past. Okay, thank yep. you. Not that I actually want to do this, but can we take all the observations from every team, from every station, and add them up and get like a gross velocity measurement for that channel? Uh, for the whole channel or just the side channel? Well, the side channel that we measured. So you wouldn't add them, you wouldn't add them all up, but it, I would like to see for each of your groups, as soon as you kind of come to a consensus about what you think is the velocity in your groups, send it to me and I, and let me know whether you are on the upstream cross section or the downstream cross section. And we'll all take a look at that. I'll, I'll send out like a, an announcement, um, with a table, um, basically kind of like showing, showing you all kind of like what the different groups got. Any other questions? No, well, I think we don't have time to get to the USGS website, but, um, I could probably go over that another time for those that are interested. If there are no further questions, then um, we're about at the end of class. So I guess I'll see you all Tuesday, although some of you are going to research computing days, which is good. <laughs>